Hello. Welcome to the Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Prairie's Got the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Morose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Check out other webinars going on for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. This afternoon at 3 p.m., there is a webinar about pollination in the prairies by Jessamyn Manson with the University of Alberta and the University of Virginia. We have a webinar tomorrow at noon about the value of waterfowl management to native prairie conservation by Corey White with Water Security Agency. Lastly, if you are in the Regina area tonight, check out Trevor Harriet's presentation about grassland matters, 7 p.m. at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. Check out our website for more information. I would like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by the University of Alberta. This project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now a bit about our presenter. Dr. Edward Bork is currently the Matthias Chair in the Rangeland Ecology and Management and also serves as the Director of the Rangeland Research Institute at the University of Alberta. He has been teaching and conducting rangeland research since 1991 on a wide range of basic and applied topics such as integrated weed control and pasture, grazing systems, bioecology, forage and legume production dynamics, landscape and disturbance ecology, and more recently on the importance of grasslands in providing environmental goods and services such as carbon storage. Dr. Bork's work has been a strong focus on addressing practical problems of high relevance to practitioners managing either private or public rangelands and has involved extensive collaboration with other researchers and agencies. Both he and his graduate students have given numerous research and extension talks on these topics. Dr. Bork and his family continue to reside on and operate a mixed farm in the Aspen Parkland region of central Alberta, Canada. Before we begin, I would like to mention that if you have any questions, please type it into the question section on your webinar dashboard. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Edward Bork. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon everyone. Thank you, Caitlin, for that introduction and thank you for the invite to speak today. Uh, hopefully I've got this all set up properly and, and Caitlin, if, if, if something's not right, then please let me know. Uh, Absolutely. Sorry? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, so what I've got for you today is basically an overview of some research that a number of us at the University of Alberta have been collaborating on over the last half dozen years or so. The title of the talk is Understanding Carbon Storage and Greenhouse Gas Uptake in Grasslands, but I'm going to diversify out from that a little bit as well. I'm going to talk about some other EGNSs, uh, particularly in, in relationship to some long-term work that we've got um, looking at grasslands across Alberta and how they respond to grazing and things like that. So I will link it to biodiversity and some other aspects that may be of interest to a number of you that are online. I'd also like to recognize a number of my collaborators in, in these different projects. That includes Dr. Carlisle, Dr. Sk uh, Scott Chang, and Dr. Uh, Dan Hewins, who's now at uh, Rhode Island uh, College. All of these individuals have been instrumental in the, in the work that we've been doing over the last number of years. So really the goal of all of these different projects, including the work that we've done on, on carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, is, is to really understand uh, the size uh, of the environmental goods and services provided to society from grasslands with the intent of developing a stronger policy that recognizes values and maintains those EGNSs. And this would apply to both public land uh, but also, perhaps more importantly, to private land where economics drive everything and they certainly drive consumer behavior. So without the underlying detailed information on the size of these environmental goods and services, it's pretty hard to promote policies that, that protect those very EGNSs that everyone benefits from. I think it's also important that we all kind of make sure we're on the same page 
wavelength when we're talking about what EGNSs are. So the typical EGNSs from rangelands, at least what the foundations of range management are rooted in, is typically around forage production and associated beef production. But rangelands do far more than that. Uh, for example, they serve in water purification and flood mitigation. Uh, anywhere you have uh, grazing or other land uses going on in, in particularly important watersheds, uh, headlands, for example, in southwestern Alberta, they also store carbon, reduce greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere. So these are important um, EGNSs that we often don't think about, and yet they're, they're certainly going on. There's some talks on pollinators, which Caitlin just referred to, uh, including later today that many of you will be tuning in on. And of course, the role of these grasslands in supporting biodiversity and habitat for both consumptive and non-consumptive species. So all of these are benefits to society. And unless we have good quantitative data on each one of them, it's pretty hard to make a, a case promoting policy and promoting land use changes or management practices that increase rather than detract from those services. So what I'd like to really cover today, I'd like to talk mostly about our carbon benchmarking study, which examined grassland responses across Alberta between 2012 and 2015. What was Particularly novel about this study is that we, uh, we looked at a very large number of sites. A lot of research investigations will only look at two or three or maybe four or five sites if you're lucky. This particular study examined well over 100, which sets it apart from many of these previous investigations. Embedded within there, we compared different land uses with one another, including grazing with more contemporary land uses, such as conversion to tame pasture and annual cropland. Uh, we also looked at how these results compared with different previous studies. So I've got some data embedded on here on what the previous literature has shown regarding changes in, in carbon storage under different land uses. And also, uh, I've brought in some data showing some of the impacts uh, that recent work uh, led by Scott Chang and others, including myself, uh, have, has revealed in terms of different agroforestry systems across north central Alberta. This work was done between 2011 and 2016 and I believe that's something to add to our understanding of where carbon is and how it relates to different land uses. Uh, and then I'm going to finish up with some discussion on current research underway, particularly looking at litter decomposition uh, patterns uh, what factors may account for that, including microbial diversity, some greenhouse gas responses to drought, and also a, a study that's just being initiated looking at adaptive multi-paddock grazing and how that might affect carbon stores and greenhouse gases. So the carbon benchmarking study uh, was really a collaborative relationship between the University of Alberta and Alberta Environment and Parks. Uh, we sampled 114 grassland exclosures distributed throughout Alberta, and you can see based on the map on the right-hand side that we had sites distributed throughout, across much of the Aspen Parkland, the dry and mesic mixed grass prairie, and also through a significant portion of the foothills, uh, so the montane grasslands, foothills fescue grasslands, and even into the upper foothills grasslands. So again, this is what set this particular study apart from many previous investigations. And we were able to assess uh, biomass, plant composition, and diversity using the data sets that AEP had compiled over the years. But then we also visited these sites and collected metrics on carbon storage, both within the vegetation and the underlying soils. This work was supported by the Alberta Livestock and Meat Agency. So here's some examples of some of the exposures we would have looked at. Um, this is the Harold Creek exposure and the Schuler exposure in very different environments. One is in the upper foothills, one is in the dry mixed grass. These exposures range anywhere from 15 to well over 60 years of age. So it allowed us to not only look at the different agroclimatic conditions on carbon stores, but also looked at, allowed us to look at the presence and absence of grazing and see how that might influence carbon, carbon levels. Before we get into the carbon data, I want to talk a little bit about what we found in terms of the plant diversity responses. Uh, because this was a, such a large data set, it allowed us to look at how uh, plant richness and diversity per se were actually responding to the presence of grazing. Now you see a number of graphs like this. It basically compares long-term non-grazed and grazed areas within the different natural subregions. regions 
and they're always arranged from the driest uh, subregion on the left side over to the most mesic, so the highest rainfall site on the far right. What was interesting is plant diversity peaked in moderate to high rainfall areas, particularly the central parkland and the foothills fescue. So you can see there's a bump of anywhere from about 15 to 20 percent in terms of the number of species that we were encountering. And this is likely a typical response to grazing actually uh, reducing the amount of litter and releasing plant species that otherwise would be suppressed in the absence of ungulates. Um, so again, we're seeing this positive bump in plant species within those those reasons uh, those regions. Pardon me, where we have intermediate moisture conditions. However, we also wanted to partition the abundance of those species that we are finding between native and introduced plant species. So one of the things we did is we basically looked at the relationship between mean growing season precipitation. You can see that on the x-axis here and the proportion of introduced Shannon's diversity. <clears throat> and what's very apparent is that right across the province, regardless of the different region, all of our, our plant communities examined had about 10% introduced species. Uh, so, and that's fairly stable regardless of whether it has a long-term grazed or ungrazed history or non-grazed history. However, where grazing actually facilitated an increase in introduced species was only in those regions of higher rainfall. And I've basically drawn an arrow on here at roughly a threshold of 350 millimeters of, of growing season precipitation. So when you get higher levels of rainfall than 350 millimeters, that actually tends to increase the risk of grazing-induced shifts towards invasive or introduced plant species. In contrast, areas below 350 millimeters appear to have greater resistance to invasion. And I mention this because it may have some implications in terms of some of the, some of the carbon responses and other growth responses that we see later on. Uh, we also looked at grassland productivity, and again we see an interesting pattern where the two regions, specifically the montane and the upper foothills, where we had the highest rainfall those are the areas where grazing, uh, in fact, tended to increase levels of above ground standing biomass productivity. So it, it's very conceivable that if we flip back to the previous graph for a moment, that the pattern of increasing rainfall leading to a higher probability of the introduction of introduced species may actually be driving this increase in productivity that you see within the montane and the upper foothills. Uh, and that's because many of these, these introduced species happen to be agronomics that are quite grazing tolerant uh, and are adapted to uh, high moisture conditions and therefore play a role in increasing productivity. We also found that long-term exposure to grazing may actually help limit shrub encroachment. And this was particularly true within the montane and the upper foothills regions. So again, those are those those pairwise comparison bars that you see on the right side of this graph where uh, the areas it can, that are continuing to be exposed to long-term grazing resulted in anywhere from about a 30 percent to a 50 or even 60 percent decline in actual shrub grazing may actually be helping contain shrub encroachment across much of our wetter environments, particularly in, in southwestern Alberta. The reason why I, I, I want to highlight this is that shrub encroachment has actually been an ongoing issue in many of these areas. I've been involved in some research uh, indicating that shrub encroachment has reduced grasslands in the Rocky Mountain Forest Reserve by as much as 58 percent. These are largely willows, but also species like bog birch that are increasing in all likelihood due to fire suppression. And in the process, they're lowering the aggregate forage productivity by up to 70%. And this, of course, has an impact on not only the potential for supporting livestock grazing, but also other ungulates in the area, including uh, uh, populations of elk and feral horses and so on. So um, again, think about the role that grazing may actually have in helping control or limit this woody plant expansion and therefore conserve these grasslands. Okay, if we switch over to, to the issue of carbon storage, just a little bit of background information on this. Grasslands are uh, 
particularly important because they store 10 to 30 percent of the world's organic carbon. And in the case of temperate grasslands, which cover about 8 percent of the Earth's surface, uh, they contain roughly 300 gigatons of carbon. And the point I want to make here is that the vast majority of this carbon is actually below ground. So, you know, when you look at the plant community, you're walking across the prairie, you're only seeing a very small fraction of the live plant biomass. And in fact, uh, the, the vast majority of the carbon itself is situated in the ground, either in roots or more likely in the form of soil, uh, organic matter and associated carbon. So that's where most of the, the carbon is actually stored. So why do grasslands have such large amounts of carbon? Well, in part, because our perennial grasslands have historically evolved to produce a lot more below ground biomass than above ground biomass. And a good example of this would be the, the root to shoot ratio work that was done by Robert Copeland, one of the early ecologists. Uh, he did some work at Matador, Saskatchewan, indicating that about 85% of the plant biomass is actually below ground. So when you're producing that much biomass below ground, those roots are grown, they turn over, they die, they feed microbes, and eventually that leads to the development of very uh, organic matter enriched and, of course, carbon-rich substrate in, in the ground. So that's why so much carbon is situated below the surface of the ground. If we look at what changes soil carbon, well, the answer to that is pretty simple. It's, it's land use change. And, you know, in addition to urban industrial development, cultivation is one of the big culprits. Uh, cultivation worldwide leads to the loss of 30 to 50 percent, and some studies even indicate up to 60 percent of the potential carbon. Uh, one of the reasons for the decline is potential erosion, which you see dramatically in this picture here. But erosion is maybe not the only source of, of soil carbon change when we take a grassland and, and, and cultivate it. There's been some work in the past. Uh, Walter Williams had initiated some, some plots that he I believe very aptly called the furnace plots in southern Alberta. You see a picture of them here where they took grassland, uh, either fescue grassland or mixed grass prairie, and converted it over into different alternative land use practices. Uh, a paper by Wang and all in 2010 showed that the initiation of continuous wheat cropping led to the loss of 19% of grassland carbon. And the majority of that carbon loss occurred during the first four years. So you can see the rates of carbon loss there. About 1.7 tons of carbon per hectare per year disappeared in the first four years. And then that rate slowed down to about a third of a ton of carbon per year. And the reason that Walter Wilms coined these the furnace plots is that once you convert a grassland into some alternative land use, the increase in soil temperature due to the lack of residual cover and, of course, the increase in the oxidative effect from cultivation itself results in greater microbial activity, higher soil temperatures. All of that comes together to basically result in the net burn-off of carbon by a more active microbial population. So there are also uh, changes in carbon, though, associated with alternative land uses. So if we look at even the conversion of grassland into, let's say, uh, tame forage species. So there's a couple of papers on this I want to mention. Uh, Whalen and all conducted a, a, an analysis in 2003 where they looked at changes in the carbon concentration in the foothills fescue. Now, soil carbon was about a, a quarter less after five to six years uh, following uh, conversion from a native grassland into a number of different agronomic species. So you can see them here. They looked at smooth brome, orchard grass, alfalfa, as well as continuous wheat production. And while the continuous wheat production resulted in a decline of 30 percent carbon concentration, even the tame forages resulted in an approximate decline of about 20 percent in carbon. And if we go to the mixed grass prairie, we see a very similar pattern. This is again from Whalen and all. Uh, soil carbon dropped roughly a third and by as much as 40 percent five to six years after conversion of mixed grass prairie. Again, the largest decline in carbon concentration was evident in the continuously cropped areas. So these are at areas converted to annual cropland. And the areas that were in uh, tame forage, such as crested wheatgrass, Russian wild rye or alfalfa, were about a third lower. <clears throat> 
So again, you can see the punitive effect on, on soil carbon associated with land use change. And so one of the questions that often comes up are why are these tame forages less effective at carbon storages? Well, one of the possibilities is that tame forages, through the breeding programs that we've implemented, that uh, we've been selecting plants to produce more above ground, since that's what we're interested in harvesting, either directly as hay, or in the case of uh, pasture, we're, we're interested in utilizing that material as fodder for our livestock. And so if plants aren't putting as much biomass into root mass, it stands to reason that you're going to have less organic matter accumulation and therefore potential carbon accumulation. This data set is from Dormar and all, and uh, it clearly indicates that the crested wheatgrass community basically had lower amounts of root mass, which is the size of the bars, and associated organic matter, you know, only about 1.2% lower organic matter, but when you start adding that up across many, many hectares of prairie, that adds up to a lot of carbon very quickly. Okay, in, the own, in our own work that we've done examining these, these benchmarking sites across the province, um, I've rolled up the data here in, into looking at the total carbon pool. So these, this is in tons per hectare, and these data are sliced into different regions, both the prairie region and the parkland region. And what we found quite conspicuously is that within the prairie region, the croplands were roughly 28% lower in terms of the total carbon pool. And this, this joins together the vegetation pool, the, 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 the carbon within the litter and mulch pool, and also the carbon within the, uh, within the soil matrix, so both organic and inorganic carbon. So in the prairie region, we're seeing a 28% decline in the size of that pool. When you add that up over a large area, that represents an enormous amount of carbon. And that difference was even more dramatic in, in the parkland, where we noticed a, a roughly a 45% reduction in the size of that carbon pool. So these numbers are pretty consistent with some of the previous data I showed you from Alberta and also studies elsewhere in the world. Okay, I want to switch gears at this point and talk a little bit about some agroforestry work um, that we've done in the past. And again, this is work that was led by, by Scott Chang and Cameron and I were also involved in this particular project. Uh, in this study, we compared hedgerows coupled with uh, croplands, uh, shelter belts paired with croplands, and then silvopastoral systems where we have aspen basically intermixed with perennial grassland. And what, what's conspicuous in this example is that the silvo pastures stored more carbon in the top 10 centimeters of mineral soil. And the reason for this is likely that the silvo pastoral system on the far right is the only one where we have two perennial systems actually contributing to carbon storage. In the case of the hedgerow and the shelter belt systems, there's a cropland in which case we have cultivation that would be dragging down carbon storage because of that earlier uh, furnace effect that I referred to. If we look at methane uptake within these same agroforestry systems, so again, this is the, the crop uh, and, and, and natural hedgerow, crop and shelter belt, pasture and aspen forest, we actually see that the highest levels of methane uptake, and, and so methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide itself, so it's particularly important to to try to quantify uh, the size of, the, of the, these emissions, we see that the uh, pasture and aspen forest had higher methane uptake. So this is a good thing because it represents net removal of methane from the atmosphere and therefore reduced potential for, uh, for global warming. And in, uh, in some of Mark Bacomfor's uh, papers that he published, and there's several of them out there. If you do a search on them, I'm sure you'll find them. Otherwise, you can, you can send me a note on this, and I can certainly get them to you if you're interested. Uh, in the final analysis that Mark did, he also looked at something called the global warming potential, which you see on the far right side. And that's an aggregate measure of the influence of, of CO2 fluxes um, as well as CH4 and N2O, so all three of the major greenhouse gases, and the overall global warming potentials were actually lower within the silvo pasture system. 
So the reason I'm going through this particular information is again to highlight and emphasize the role of the perennial pasture system within the silvopasture system. So these are grasslands embedded together with the forest. And so they have a very important role in, 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 again, not only carbon storage, but also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So another question that often comes up is how quickly does carbon recover once it's lost by cultivation? Well, we don't really have a good answer to this, uh, but there are some, some studies that we can maybe pull in here to talk about it a little bit. Uh, Dormer and Smoliak back in 1985 looked at areas of the mixed grass prairie that were abandoned following cultivation. They were allowed to recover naturally to mixed grass prairie. And then after 50 years, uh, John Dormar and Silver Smoliak basically went in and assessed soil organic matter and root mass. And what was particularly striking here is that again, if you look at the graph, the total root mass in the area revegetated after 50 years had not recovered and that's after 50 full years of recovery, and we see the organic matter levels also lagging behind those in the adjacent native mixed grass. And so what it highlights is that our prairie systems, while they store a lot of carbon, once they're cultivated and that carbon is released, they may have relatively low resilience or recoverability, uh, implying that there's a long-term opportunity cost in carbon storage once we convert them over. Okay, we've also done a little bit of uh, economic modeling and I don't want people to think about this too much. So in our carbon benchmarking study, uh, we basically used the comparative land use numbers that we got from our cropped areas our, our, and our uh, native grassland. We attached a $15 per ton CO2 equivalent, which is the value basically that the CCEMC attached to it. Now CCEMC is known as Emissions Reduction Alberta. And we basically uh, use that to extrapolate out what's the value of carbon that's actually currently being retained by not cultivating it within each of the prairie and parkland. So if you look at the two bars on the left, you'll see that each of the prairie and parkland uh, the value of the carbon that's currently stored in remaining native prairie is worth roughly $4 billion. And that's at a valuation of $15 per ton. That valuation has actually gone up to $20 per ton this past January. So the numbers you're looking at on the screen, that's an underestimate. And the numbers are even more striking when you look at the value of carbon previously lost. So this is looking at the land area of, of cropland and then working backwards to figure out how much carbon have we potentially lost from these systems. And in the case of the parkland, because so much land area has been converted, once we take those changes in carbon stores, we attach a $15 per ton value on it, we're looking at around $11 billion of carbon that's been lost. So these are large large numbers, economic numbers that we're attached, you know, potentially attaching to the value of carbon that's either retained or has already been lost by previous land use conversion. And, and I want to highlight that there's likely, a, you know, significant amount of error in here. So these are ballpark numbers only, but for comparative purposes, I think they get the message across. We've also done some work uh, working with uh, Guillermo uh, Hernandez Ramirez, uh, who works in the soils department at the U of A. Uh, we've done some comparison of our native grassland introduced pasture and annual cropland to look at different soil health metrics. In particular, we've looked at something called fractal index, which is basically a measure of the aggregation. So when you take a soil and you uh, work it into pieces in your hand, is there healthy aggregate particles, which are important for storing water, allowing root growth, and so on. Um, and then also looking at the ability of those soils to actually hold and deliver water under increasing drought stress. These, these would all be important agronomic properties. And what was interesting here is the native grasslands had comparatively better metrics of soil quality all round. Um, they, native grassland had higher maximum water availability. They had higher soil porosity and the fractal index was higher, meaning the aggregation properties were inherently better. So this is an interesting uh, new uh, type of, of 
of tool that's coming up in evaluating soil properties in relation to different land uses. And this particular paper is in press right now. So something we haven't talked about too much is what about grazing and carbon? So grazing is a widespread land use across Western Canada. If you look in the literature, grazing effects on carbon are very inconsistent and are difficult to predict. And they're, they're often very, very site specific. So we see very disparate responses depending on whether we're in the mixed grass prairie or foothills fescue or central parkland. And many previous investigations have only looked at one or two locations. So creating ambiguity as to whether there's a universal effect of grazing on carbon. Well, in our particular study, uh, we actually, we didn't see a, a clear indication that grazing was increasing or decreasing carbon for that, matter, for that matter. We did see a weak trend for greater soil organic carbon in five of the six study regions, but these increases remain non-significant. So you can see them here that in the mixed grass, the central parkland, the foothills fescue, the montane, and even the upper foothills, our total carbon uh, mass tended to be greater within grazed areas, but again, there's so much site-specific variability that this didn't quite come out as a significant effect. Uh, we've submitted a paper around, along these lines right now and are awaiting uh, final review on this. And what was also interesting, uh, this is despite the fact that we know that grazing, because it removes standing biomass, it removes litter, it removes mulch, um, that that reduction in any veg carbon appears to be offset by any change in soil organic carbon, maybe this marginal increase in soil organic carbon. The net result is that in any case, soil carbon does not appear to decline under long-term grazing. It also doesn't appear to increase, but it doesn't decline. So it tends to indicate that grazing seems to be compatible with maintaining carbon. Uh, we also noticed that grazing impacted below ground vegetation as well. Uh, this was an interesting uh, response, uh, particularly in the montane. Again, you can see the, the comparison across the different regions. And in the montane region, was, which is one of those higher rainfall environments of southwestern Alberta, grazing actually appeared to stimulate root production in the top 30 centimeters of the, of the soil. And remember that this coincides with a point I made earlier, which is that we tended to see higher shoot biomass as well in the montane and the upper foothills. And again, this may be related to the fact that these montane and upper foothill environments tend to have a greater amount of introduced plant species. So the, the invasion of these introduced plant species, many of them agronomics, may actually be driving higher shoot production as well as root production. Okay, I'd like to transition uh, for the last 10, 15 minutes here to talking a little bit about some other studies that, that we're, we're currently working on. Uh, so we've, we've taken uh, the previous results in a number of different directions to understand better the mechanisms that might regulate where, when, and how uh, grazing actually alters um, uh, carbon and associated greenhouse gas uh, um, emissions. So one of the things that we've been looking at, Dan Hewins was instrumental in this project, uh, looking at grazing effects on decomposition of, of litter uh, on the surface of the soil, and some of the preliminary results, uh, Sean Chuan is, is finalizing his masters on this, is that decomposition appears to have been enhanced by long-term exposure to grazing, and this is particularly apparent in those areas that have higher rainfall. So largely the foothills, but also to some extent the central parkland. So these would be areas that have uh, moisture regimes that uh, have PDE ratios that are closer to that 1.0 mark. So where moisture is less tending to be uh, limiting for plant growth and maybe for uh, decomposition. And so one potential here is that this could reflect incorporation of that litter into the mulch layer and into the soil organic matter more effectively over time. If you look at the graph, you can see that the three red lines, those are basically the foothills, parkland, and mixed grass uh, uh, grazed levels of, of mass loss over time. Uh, that's an 18-month period. You can see that the red lines tend to fall below that of the non-grazed environments. Uh, 
So whether it's direct effects from a change in microclimate or whether it's from uh, changes in composition or maybe a change in the microbial community, uh, all of those things could, could have a, a role to play here. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, some of the work that Sean is doing is also showing that litter decomposition also uh, is varying among different grass species. So some of the work that Sean is doing is comparing uh, the graph that you're looking at here is comparing western wheatgrass, Pascopyrum smithii, foothills rough fescue, Festuca campestris, June grass, Calaria macranta, and Poa pertensis, which is a very common introduced species across much of the, the parkland and southwestern Alberta. And what you can see when you look at the litter mass curves here is that Poa pertensis is actually decomposing the fastest. Uh, as indicated by its litter decomposition curve after 18 months in the field. And so grazing by creating a species composition shift away from, let's say, some of our native species towards Kentucky bluegrass may actually be changing rates of litter decomposition and perhaps that could be responsible for altering carbon cycling and certainly carbon accumulation over time. So this is, this is one of the mechanisms that we're digging into uh, in more detail. Uh, Katerina Skolnikova is another master's student uh, under Cam's guidance, Cameron Carlisle's guidance, and uh, uh, Kate is looking at comparative greenhouse gas uptake under long-term grazing. And although her work to date is showing no statistical differences in CO2 or N2O flux in relation to grazing, if you look at the graph in front of you, see if I can get my cursor going here, you'll see that there's a trend for the grazed uh, gray CO2 levels or fluxes to be lower in each of the zones. So I'm comparing these two here, I'm comparing these two here, I'm comparing these two here. So regardless of whether it's the parkland, foothills, fescue, or dry mixed grass, we, we tend to see lower fluxes. And we also tend to see the same pattern in N2O where the grazed areas tend to have lower release of N2O in the parkland, the dry mixed grass, and the foothills, fescue. So, Again, although there's no statistical differences here, where there's smoke, there's fire, there seems to be an interesting pattern here, and so more digging is going to have to occur uh, in order to tease apart uh, where and when these types of effects uh, are possible. Uh, we're also involved in uh, some additional, uh, very interesting new study. This is addressing the role of AMP grazing. AMP stands for adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Some of you may know this as time control grazing or holistic uh, grazing or management intensive grazing or planned grazing. There's all kinds of different terminologies for this. But the idea is pretty simple. You take a large area, you break it up into much smaller paddocks, you graze or rotate the animals through under fairly tightly controlled conditions with short grazing periods and very long recovery periods. Um, Mark Boyce is leading initiative through the University of Alberta with many, many other scientists involved, uh, including myself and, and, and Scott Chang and Cameron Carlisle and others, uh, in order to look at soil carbon and greenhouse gas emissions from these systems. And we'll be working on private ranches across Western Canada. Uh, I want to share a little bit in terms of some previous results that may actually shed some light onto uh, some of the interesting patterns that we might expect to see. Uh, we've done some small plot research down at the Matheus Ranch in southeastern Alberta uh, comparing uh, different individual clipping trials. And in this case, there's a deferred defoliation treatment, there's a high-intensity, low-frequency defoliation treatment, and a high-intensity, high-frequency defoliation treatment. I call that the Armageddon treatment, so heavy repeated defoliation with minimal chances for recovery. And if you look at the green boxes here, uh, in particular this bar, that is showing the amount of uh, methane basically taken up. So a, a negative number is a good factor here. It's a good response metric because it's suggesting there's net uptake of methane into the soil. And so the high intensity, low frequency bars uh, are lower than what we see under the high intensity, high frequency bars. So it suggests that the, the frequency of defoliation may play a key role in basically the uptake of methane within these grasslands. 
And that would provide some support for this notion that AMP grazing could be an important management strategy uh, to reduce greenhouse gas footprints in agricultural landscapes. And we see a, another similar result. Uh, this is uh, Kai and all 2016, looking at these same plots from the Matheus Ranch. These are N2O emissions, N2O being a, 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 oops, a, a rather potent greenhouse gas. And if you look at the comparison here, uh, you will see that the highest levels of N2 emission were again associated with the high intensity, high frequency defoliation. So there is, uh, there is something to be said for regulating the frequency of defoliation and the length of the recovery period in order to optimize the amount of methane uptake and in this case nitrous oxide uptake. So the current state of carbon offset programs in agriculture, well there are a number of programs for agricultural producers. The, the tis, uh, tillage systems protocol is probably the one that's best known, uh, which is payment for reductions in CO2 through reduced and no-till agronomic practices. It usually amounts to about a dollar per acre and producers have to uh, verify that they're practicing minimum or direct seeding to be eligible for it. Uh, what's ironic about this program is that uh, producers that are cropping are being incentivized to practice minimum tillage and yet the practice of cropping is actually leading to much lower levels of carbon relative to perennial grasslands to begin with. And, and so the policy implications for carbon storage in grasslands seem to be clear. Why is it that there are no incentives for maintaining carbon in existing native grasslands despite the fact that these native systems have higher carbon levels, they have greater greenhouse gas uptake potentially, including potentially under these AMP systems, and more favorable soil health. So uh, the, the policy implications, I believe, are, are that there should be far more incentives in place for landowners to be recognized for the role of grasslands in providing these EGNSs. And hopefully uh, this information can assist in developing policies to value grassland carbon stores. Uh, will likely be a combination of, of regulated uh, offsets and, and potentially the voluntary market. Uh, we're working with uh, folks in the government of Alberta with organizations such as Ducks Unlimited and, uh, and others uh, in order to try to promote these, these policies as much as possible. I briefly want to mention the Rangeland Research Institute, uh, which I've had the pleasure of heading up for the last number of years, and it's an organization dedicated to promoting uh, and, and conducting research and teaching and outreach, of course, on rangelands and the ultimate goal of improving rangeland sustainability. And as I said, a large focus of this particular institute has been uh, looking at many uh, environmental goods and services, including biodiversity, uh, carbon storage, and so on. We have our own built-in competitive grants program to provide seed money for different research initiatives, uh, and so on. And all of this wouldn't have been possible without the uh, generous donation of, of the Matheus Ranch a number of years ago from Edwin and Ruth Matheus um, in southeastern Alberta. So some of the take-home messages, uh, I know my time is, I'm coming right up to quarter two. Uh, take-home messages are native grasslands provide abundant EGNS in comparison to croplands. And that includes forage production, uh, carbon storage, soil health, potentially greenhouse gas uptake, uh, with an increasing amount of work underway to develop policies valuing this service. One of the projects I didn't even mention was also looking at quantifying the diversity and abundance of the microbial communities within, within uh, under these different treatments. Uh, we're doing that in, in some of the work that we're undertaking um, in, in the benchmarking program, but we're also planning on doing that in the adaptive multi-paddock grazing trial. Uh, Karen Thompson is a postdoc working with myself, Sylvie Cadeau, and Cameron Carlisle, and uh, I believe she'll be giving a talk tomorrow afternoon, so if you're interested in some of the microbial aspects, you'll be able to hear a little bit more on some of the tools that, that she's using to assess these systems. And another take-home message is that moderate grazing can enhance some EGNSs and certainly maintain them. 
some of the benefits that came across were enhanced plant diversity, even forage production, and certainly maintaining carbon. Uh, we didn't see any signs that carbon declined under ongoing grazing practices. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank some of the predominant funding agencies over the last number of years, the Alberta Livestock Meat Agency, uh, the, uh, the Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, and Alberta uh, Environment and Parks, who have had a significant role to play in many of these projects. There's been a small army of undergraduates and graduate students that have uh, uh, generously uh, provided data into this presentation. So that's what I have. I'd be happy to try to take any questions if there are any in, in the time that's remaining. Thanks. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, we do have a couple questions here, if that's okay. Uh, Absolutely. If anyone else has any questions, just please feel free to, uh, to type it into the question section on the webinar dashboard. Uh, there's a question here from Frederick. You mentioned a CH4 uptake at one point. Did you mean that CH4 emissions from soils were avoided, or do you imply that there is an actual mechanism of CH4 uptake by plants or microorganisms? So, great question. So, you remember that you're listening to a plant ecologist who's being moved more and more into the area of soils. So, my understanding is, yes, the, the way the, the question was phrased, that's absolutely correct, that we are seeing greater net uptake of methane within soils that are exposed to certain treatments. So, in the example that I showed you, and I'll just flip back to uh, my presentation here. So, I'm looking again at the comparison of the high-intensity, high-frequency defoliation treatments as opposed to the high intensity, low frequency. A negative value in this graph is a good thing because it means that methane is literally being removed from the atmosphere. So, and again, this is my root of, fairly rudimentary understanding of uh, methane dynamics in the soil. But methane can either be produced by microbes or it, be, it can be catabolized, in which case it's being removed from the atmosphere. And in this case, what we're seeing is that there are net negative levels of production under the high intensity, low frequency. So what that means is that there's more methane be, being removed than, it, than, are, than is being generated. So that's a good thing under the high intensity, low frequency treatment. In contrast, the high intensity, high frequency treatment. So and I equate that to the con basically a continuous grazing regime where the vegetation isn't getting any chance for recovery. It's repeatedly being taken down to ground level. That in that case, we have almost a neutral, a slight uptake of methane, but really not, uh, not very favorable in comparison to the plots that received a much longer recovery period. So the question about uh, the question about what's causing this is a good one. So in the microbial work that Karen Thompson is doing and the other folks that are working on this, we are looking at the diversity and composition of different microbes within the soil. And the reason we're interested in doing that is, for example, to quantify the abundance of methanotropes. So those are basically that group of bacteria that basically um, uh, synthesis or uh, metabolize methane and thereby removing it from the atmosphere. So hopefully that answered the question. It was a fairly long answer, but hopefully I didn't create confusion with that. That's okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, there's another question from Frederick. As an interpretation of the loss of soil carbon, do you consider the possible phenomenon of priming effects when switching from grassland to cropland? Example, the destabilization of stable organic matter in the, sto in the soil by the input of carbon from the new plant communities. And no, we don't typically, and I understand that's, a, that's an interesting point. So if, if I'm reading the question right, if you switch from, let's say, native grassland into cropland because you might have so much more productivity, 
that that might in turn generate a higher level of microbial activity which may actually account for some of the reduction in carbon. Um, one of the things that we did in the selection of all the comparative land use sites, at least in our benchmarking study, we made sure that all of the study sites we investigated were at least 15 and preferably 20 years plus old. And that was to avoid any potential ambiguity as to whether this was the result of short-term dynamics associated with a shift from one land use to another. So in theory, our land use comparisons would have taken place on study sites where hopefully those uh, the treatments being tested would have been close to or even at their new dynamic equilibrium in soil carbon based on the new management regime. So if we till the soil and we're putting in monoculture crops and we're fertilizing, we're doing all those kinds of things, after 20 years it would have reached a new uh, stable state in the soil. So that's our assumption, but I realize that the point about priming could certainly go on in the short term. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Um, there's another question here from Jessica. Jessica is asking, you mentioned that grazing appeared to stimulate root biomass in the montane region. Why was that again? That's a very, very good, that's a really, really good question. Uh, so there's a number of possibilities here. One is that the the montane environment is one of the more fertile and wetter environments out of all the, the six study regions that we investigated. And because it's such a wet environment, if in the absence of herbivory or any other kinds of disturbances, we may actually be seeing stagnation. So keep in mind that some of these exclosures are pushing 60 years or older in age. So when you go look at some of these exclosures, they may have 10 to 20 centimeters of thick thatch layer coupled with litter, and that's going to create all kinds of changes to the energy flow within the community. For example, it's going to cool the soil, it's going to reduce the amount of light getting into the ground, and also that litter is going to represent a lot of bound up nutrients above, uh, you know, ab above the ground. So it's very possible that those montane exclosures were actually starting to undergo stagnation because of being rested from grazing for such an extended period of time. In contrast, the grazed areas, because there's this regular turnover of litter, uh, turnover of, um, of biomass, restoration of more normal um, hydro, uh, hydrological conditions and evil thermal conditions that that may, you know, and nutrient cycling is occurring as well, that that may promote and continue to maintain conditions more favorable for root production over time. So that's one of the possibilities. I, we don't know this for sure, but it, it's an interesting possibility. Out of all the regions we studied, the montane would probably have you know, fertile soil and, and favorable rainfall, that's more akin to what you would see in the tall grass prairie uh, in, in regions of, of Wisconsin and Minnesota and, and, and those areas, which is, when, when I think of stagnation, those are the most likely areas to undergo stagnation, but we could be seeing it in the montane as well. And, and the, the ongoing exposure to grazing may actually be having some beneficial effects in that regard. That's great. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, we do have another question here by Frederick again. It was shown that grazing was leading to a lower coverage by woody shrubs. Would this be positive or negative on total soil carbon stocks? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, so I just flipped back to that slide. Yes, indeed. So, I, I'm going to answer that question two ways. So, soil carbon stocks, it, first of all, I don't have data to answer that question specifically. 
Uh, if, to do that, we would have to stratify our assessment based on the abundance of shrubs and then start partitioning it that way. However, we, here's what I can tell you, um, which is that when we look at how carbon is allocated in forested systems as opposed to grassland systems, we obviously see a change in the distribution of where carbon is stored. So shrublands contain a significant amount of carbon above ground through biomass accumulation. There's, there's no doubt about that. And there was a paper published not too long ago by, I believe it was uh, Yu Guangbai or perhaps his graduate student in Saskatchewan that looked at carbon accumulation and storage associated with western snowberry patches. And indeed, they considered that these western snowberry patches, which are quite different than the, the foothill shrublands that we're talking about, that they are an important potential source of, of storing carbon, undoubtedly. The thing that you need to keep in mind, though, when we look at, for example, the Aspen Parkland and expansion of Aspen into uh, open grasslands, and we see that pattern across much of central Alberta, Saskatchewan, and even into southwestern Alberta, where you see expansion of aspen, you're sequestering quite a bit of carbon above ground, but it also means you're creating, you're creating conditions within the mineral soil that's more likely to result in potential degradation of carbon. You know, you, you see changes in the physical properties of the soil and, uh, and, and degradation of that AH horizon, so that humified AH horizon, which normally stores a lot of carbon. So I'm answering this question carefully because on one hand, by getting shrub encroachment in the foothills, we're clearly building up an above ground pool of carbon that wasn't there otherwise within the shrub population. But we may also, over time, be changing the amount of carbon that's stored below ground in the humified AH horizon. Now, one thing that is true is that humified carbon in the soil is generally quite protected from disturbances, at least in the short term. So if we were to get a large-scale wildfire coming through and burning off a lot of these shrubs, a lot of that carbon would be released potentially very quickly back to the atmosphere. And that's not necessarily the case with carbon that's in the soil. So I'm kind of tiptoeing around Frederick's question there. I'm pretty sure the carbon allocation has definitely changed above and below ground. It's likely changed also within the mineral soil, although I can't say by how much. Um, and I couldn't tell you whether the total carbon budget has changed or not, but I will say that by having that shrub community, it's potentially at greater risk of being released through something like fire. Hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, there is a question here from a listener named Annette. You mentioned Kentucky bluegrass and some places would consider it invasive and not a desirable plant to introduce. Is there any studies on which types of grasses would help store more carbon, potentially helping producers on which grasses might be better to plant? That's, that's actually one of the questions that we are interested in, in trying to get a handle on. So I flipped back to the, one of the earlier slides I had where we clearly have seen an increase in the, the relative abundance and the contribution of introduced plant species at higher levels of rainfall. And that's, that's happening mostly in southwestern Alberta. You know, we're, we're, we're going from about 10% of the community of introduced species and we're jumping to a high, I believe it was 34.5% within the upper foothills. And much of the, not all of it, but much of the, the composition uh, or, or vegetation that was comprised of introduced plant species consisted of species like Timothy smooth brome, and the biggest one is at Kentucky bluegrass. We know that Kentucky bluegrass is very much a widespread species anywhere we have moderate to, to even higher levels of grazing throughout uh, any regions of more favorable rainfall. So I'm just going to flip back down here to this comparison of the different plant species on decomposition. This is actually one of the main uh, I think this goes to the, the heart of Annette's question. We are actually trying 
to discern the difference between these different plant species because our working theory is that a change in species composition, for example, grazing in the foothills, by reducing the abundance of the primary decreasers, the, the native bunch grasses that normally would be colonizing the site, and shifting it towards species that may be more productive over the short term, species like Poa pretensis being one of them, and, and Poa would also account for why we may be seeing such a surge in root biomass within the top 30 centimeters of soil as well because it has a right zomatous root system, this creeping root system, so it's very effective at colonizing the surface of the soil. So by having this shift towards uh, Kentucky bluegrass, and if that carbon burns off more quickly, which is what this curve is showing, that might account for a reduction in carbon. On the other hand, we don't really know where this rapid decomposition of Kentucky bluegrass is actually, we don't know where the carbon is going to. Um, this is what's called a litter bag study, which tells us that yes, uh, Kentucky bluegrass is, is breaking down more quickly, but we don't know is what's the fate of that carbon. If it's being broken down and released back to the atmosphere as CO2, that would work against us in terms of carbon storage. But if the carbon is breaking down and potentially leaching, for example, down into the soil that is being mobilized elsewhere, that could actually be helping carbon, um, a carbon storage within the ecosystem. So while this graph that I'm showing here with litter mass loss is very intriguing, particularly in relation to Kentucky bluegrass, we still need to understand you know, what is the fate of that carbon? Where is it ending up? If it's back in the atmosphere, it's not a good thing, and it could be de decreasing carbon storage. If it's working its way down into the mulch layer and then being immobilized by microbes and elsewhere, that could be a good thing. So this is part of our, you know, to, to Annette's question, this is why we're doing this. We hope to get more detailed understanding of the mechanisms responsible for that over time. Great, thank you. Uh, we have, I think it might be our last question from Laura, and um, I think this might be a good way to to finish our webinar here. Laura is asking, recognizing the currently that currently no incentives exist for maintaining carbon stores in an existing native prairie, what, in your opinion, would be the most effective way to create incentives that would work on both public and private lands to support native grassland retention as a uh, carbon mitigation or sorry um carbon mitigation strategy do we need to create monetary incentives or do you foresee a mixed approach well i, I think a, i think a mixed approach is warranted but in the end i think it will have to be a monetary incentive because when when push comes to sh okay so on and let me break that question up into two pieces because, I mean, that's the kind of granddaddy of all questions. On public land, it should clearly be a mixed approach. Um, and the reason for that is because we have multiple goods and services that are flowing from those areas. Uh, one of the reasons we were, we, you know, why I took the time to present some information on biodiversity and production responses and so on is because even though the focus of this talk was on carbon storage and greenhouse gases, it's still important to recognize the value of forage production within, let's say, uh, public lands, you know, associated with with different environments in Alberta, and and there are it's more than just livestock production that relies on that forage production. It's it's elk and it's deer and it's a number of other herbivores, including feral horses, and so. Uh, land use management relies not only on biodiversity, it relies on that forage production, and hopefully we can optimize the amount of carbon that's coming out of there as well. So I think a mixed approach, uh, you know, partly through government regulations and improved management practices and guidelines for those areas, uh, and potentially voluntary offsets within those zones, they're going to likely, um, that's probably going to be what we're going to have to do. On public land, I think in the past, if you look at what we have been doing, we've been relying on the altruism of individual individual landowners to basically um, protect and maintain EGNSs other than forage production. 
So if there's a private rancher and they're being depredated on by elk, uh, so elk are coming in and feeding on forage that they have maybe stockpiled for their livestock, we're expecting the landowner to incur that cost. And that's probably just not acceptable because on the bottom line is economics drives everything for landowners. And this was particularly the case post BSE when we had very challenging economics and producers were desperately trying to find uh, sources of income to sustain themselves. And other than, than, than forage production and livestock production, they had you know oil and gas revenues and off-farm income. That was their other source of support. The, the stance that I'm taking is that these private lands are actually doing far more things than supplying just forage. They're, they're supplying biodiversity, which is another area that we've been working on actively to try to quantify the size of those benefits. And, you know, I may be pouring gasoline on fire here, but we're one of the few places in the world that does not value habitat directly by allowing a landowner a mechanism to actually um, conserve those areas by, by attaching a dollar value to it. If you go to the US and Africa and Australia and Europe even, there is a dollar value attached to habitat so that landowners can derive a source of revenue from those areas so that they can manage them better or even improve on them. And the same applies in, in the area of carbon. Um, our first step was to try to quantify the size of that carbon pool. And once we know the size of that carbon pool, go back to policymakers and say, we need to put incentives in place, whether they're regulated or whether they're voluntary. And, and, and I really see that the leadership here coming from government. I mean, government has, has led the development of uh, these policies such as the reduced tillage protocol, there are reduced days on feed for uh, uh, confined feeding of livestock in feedlots, and yet there's nothing really that applies at this point in terms of the, uh, you know, the types of market mechanism that we should see in place for these perennial grasslands. And, it, and so I'm kind of trying to lead the crusade that awareness is everything, but that awareness should extend from researchers and from industry through members of the general public and ultimately to regulators and policymakers so that we kind of wake up and say, yes, we need to put provisions in place for landowners to reap benefits from these services. And if they don't, we're going to continue to see attrition or ongoing loss of these areas. Uh, we're still seeing land use conversion of, of relatively arid mixed grass prairie uh, in southeastern Alberta, areas that probably should never be converted. And so they're doing it for short-term economic gain, but in the process there's a whole variety of public uh, goods that are being lost, including carbon storage. And it'll be very difficult potentially to even get those back. So I'm not sure I answered that question. I think I kind of did, but... Yeah, um, I think you did. <laughs> it's, a, it, it, it's a complex one, and it's going to involve a lot of different players, including economists and regulators and policymakers in the process. Definitely. Well, thank you very, very much for the great presentation. Uh, there's been quite a few comments written in that says thank you very much for this webinar and for the answers that you've provided. So I know the listeners have really enjoyed the presentation as well. And I just want to take a minute to thank all of the attendees for coming in. Uh, when you leave the webinar, you will receive a quick um, survey. It's just one minute, like three questions. So if you don't mind taking a minute to answer that, that would really help us out so we can do this event again. And I just want to encourage everyone to... Um, to check out the PCAP website and go to um, events and Ecological Goods and Services Week 2017. And there's a schedule there for all of the events that will be going on throughout this week. So this is one of the first of many. Um, this recording or this video has been recorded and it will also be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel. And you can check that out later this afternoon and pass on the link to anyone who's not able to, to make it today. So thank you very much to everyone for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you to Saskatchewan PCAP and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thank you. Bye. Bye.